Martin Turner here. This week, Maria Tyler leads the lecture as we look at restating our firm's balance sheet and discuss some common questions people have so far. And first, Maria reminds us about why we are restating our firm's financial statements in our unit. Okay, so this week we're continuing our look at analysing the financial statements. So we began this topic, this topic lasts three weeks in our units. It starts in week five and, we, and it lasts to week seven. And we cover each of the main statements that you have to restate in our unit, essentially over these three weeks. So in week five, two weeks ago, remember, because we had the break week, um, we covered the restating of statement of changes in equity, the tips and hints on that. Um, I do know that a number of you have actually already completed restating of all the other statements as well, which is fine. You might actually be able to add to some of the questions that we have today or also interact on the social media forums um, for students who are still to restate the balance sheet and income statements. So today for us is going to be um, mainly about restate tips and hints on restating the balance sheet. But before we get into it, I just want to go through a reminder again about the purpose of restating in our unit, as well as some of the common questions so far. And if I can just remind everybody just to mute your microphone, so bottom left hand corner, um, that'll just make it better for everybody to hear me a bit more clearly. Thank you. Again, we'll finish off with the minute paper. So having said that, if you can log in, if you're not logged into your slides, can you log in? And to do that, you can either go to the echo360.org.au website or on our unit's um, Moodle site, if you scroll down to week six, click into the second link where it says Echo360 week six lecture slides. So that's the ones that I'll be going through. And right at the end, there's a few interactive slides where you can write and I can see your responses that way because I can't see the Zoom chat. Okay, so just a reminder from week five about why we are actually restating in our unit. And remember, restating in our unit simply means to move line items around, okay? So the, the reason we're getting you to do that is because we want you to become familiar with financial statements. We also want you to learn to use Excel, okay? So for some of you, this will be the very first time that you've been exposed to Excel. And that's great. For some of you, you're Excel experts. And so you can also um, continue your learning journey by helping out others. It's not about learning to restate itself per se, although that is a useful skill to also have, even if it's just for your own personal investing in the future. Um, I can still hear a couple microphones. So can everybody just make sure bottom left hand corner of your screen, if you can mute them. I'm not sure if, if teaching staff if we Voice is not coming. Sorry? It's fine. Your voice is not coming. The what's not coming? It is good now. It's coming. Oh, it's all good. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Um, so just some questions from students to the teaching team. I've just consolidated some of them and, and some of them will be quite pertinent to being able to balance your restated balance sheet, okay? So in your balance sheet, some of you have got net liabilities instead of net assets. What does that mean? Well, essentially it means you've got greater liabilities than you do assets. So your firm owes money to more people than it's actually got assets to pay that with. Not really a great financial position to be in, um, that also means you'll have negative equity. So again, not, not really the best financial position to be in, but it does exist. And if you do have that situation, that's still fine. You can still balance your debits and credits, okay? So that's all it means. The fundamental concept that you need to adhere to is debits must equal credits, okay? So that's why in a balance sheet we, we look at or we focus on the accounting equation where you've got generally you've got your assets or your debits on the left and then your credits on the right, liabilities and equity. If you've got the other way, your um, equity will actually be debit. If you've got 
net liabilities, you, you're going to have a debit um, equity because your net liabilities will be credit. Okay, but that's still fine. As long as your debit's balanced with your credits, you can still balance your balance sheet. The next question is, why do some of my lines go bold? Does formatting really matter? Why can't I just leave it as it is without making it pretty? So if you've been, this is a student who who has watched my step-by-step um, -step tutorial videos. So some of the lines do go bold because Martin has pre-formatted them in that way uh, from previous work that we were doing in there or from something that we've copied and pasted which had that bolding format. So your lines sometimes will automatically go bold because of a preset format. So you can always change that, right click the cell, click format cell, and then you can change, or you can just use the shortcut keys on your ribbon up the top to press the B or the underline or whatever you'd like to format. Does formatting really matter? Um, if you've watched my videos, you know, the big resounding answer to that is yes. I definitely think presentation matters. I sort of look at your presented Excel sheets as your physical presentation. So, um, you know, if, if you'd go to a job interview rocking up in your PJs, you'd probably get a, a fairly different response if you rocked up in a suit. Um, and to me, that's how important formatting is. So when I see an Excel spreadsheet that's completed and it's got missing, um, mismatched colour lines and there's different fonts and sizes and it just looks quite generally untidy, um, it certainly is a lot less appealing to mark than one that's properly formatted and that looks very neat and presentable with everything consistent, uh, colour coded properly and so forth. So I think formatting really does matter but obviously that's a personal preference. Why can't you just leave it as is without making it pretty? Well you can just leave it as is as I just said, like that's your prerogative to choose what you wear every day and how you present yourself as you go out. Um, same with presenting your Excel spreadsheet to your marker. You can just leave it as is without making it pretty. However, just remember that's a reflection on you and your work as well. Okay, the next question. If I don't have a number for one year, do I just put a dash in the cell? A number of students did do this um, with assignment one and that's okay for assignment one. However, because in assignment two, everything will be linked from assignment one. This won't work because we're using formulas. So when you put a dash in an Excel cell, it recognises it as a different format to a number. So if you put a zero in there, or if you just leave it blank, you can still have that cell recognised as a number. If you put a dash in the cell, it changes that format usually to a text cell. Um, sometimes to a customised format cell, which means if you go to link that cell in a formula and drag it across all four years in your assignment two, you'll get a hashtag value error. Okay, so you don't want errors. You just want to be able to just link and fill your formulas, formulas across and not have any errors come up. So if you cannot put a dash in the cell, if you don't have a number for one year, just leave it blank. That would be the best just leave that cell blank. Don't put a dash in there. If you've got a number for a year and it's actually zero, so some firms will actually have zero. So they've had movement in that activity in that particular item for the year, but at the end of the year, it was zero. So for example, Ryman Healthcare's cash balance, it obviously had cash during the year and it traded with cash, but at the balance date on the financial statements, it had zero cash. So, so if you've got that situation, I would put zero rather than leaving it blank. And that distinguishes between the fact that that item had movement in it and just ended up with a zero balance, or the fact that there just wasn't, that item didn't exist in the year. This year, it might have been previously years, but this year it didn't, so we just leave it blank. Don't put a dash in the cell, just leave it blank. Why do some of my statements say as at instead of for the year ending. Um, I think I might have covered this in one of the videos. In fact, I'm pretty sure I do. But essentially, all of your financial statements show you figures and performance of your company over a period of time. So those statements will say income statement, consolidated statements, statement of changes in equity 
for the year ending or for the period ending because they're trying to tell you that particular statement shows you the movements over a period. The only statement, it won't be some of your statements, it will be one statement in your financial statements, will say as at is the balance sheet. And that is because the balance sheet doesn't show you movement over a period of time. It shows you figures as at one point in time and that's balance date. So it only shows you the figures captured for one day in that whole financial year or financial period that's being reported. So why does your balance sheet say as at? Because literally it's presenting figures as at one day in the whole year. Whereas the other financial statements reflect figures um, over a period of time. Okay, so again, my balance sheet says total assets, but my friends says net assets. What's the difference? So you'll come across this, particularly now because we've all entered our balance sheets and we'll come to restating them. Total assets simply means your company has balanced their balance sheet using the total assets figure. So they'll list all of the assets and they'll get a arrive at a sum figure. They will then use that figure to balance the rest of the balance sheet which is the liabilities and equity. So you will have the debits being the total assets on one side, that'll be the one figure. Then you'll have usually underneath, they will list their liabilities and equity, all the credits, and they will add all of those together to get another sum figure. And those two figures should match the total assets plus, uh, sorry, the total assets should equal the total liabilities plus total equity. Okay, that's the total assets method. The net assets method means that your balance sheet has been balanced using net assets. Now, net assets being your total assets minus the total liabilities to give you a net asset um, situation. So you've got a total figure for total assets and take away all of your um, liabilities, you will get net assets, okay? Then they use that net assets figure to balance to equity. All right, and that's quite common. It doesn't matter which way your company balances their balance sheet, whether they do it by total assets, equaling total liabilities plus total equity, or whether it does total assets minus total liabilities equals net assets, and then balances that to total equity, it doesn't matter, as long as your balance sheet balances. And when you're restating, that's again, what we want to see. Your balance sheet still should balance. Your debits still must match your credits. And when we said earlier, some people's um, companies actually don't even have net assets. They've got net liabilities. <laughs> so they've actually got more liabilities than they do assets. It doesn't matter again, as long as you can balance your debits and credits. That's the fundamental concept with um, restating your balance sheet entering your balance sheet and restating your balance sheet. Your balance sheet must match debits and credits. That's why it's called a balance sheet. Um, one of my Mackay students actually said, um, help me out, I've got two balance sheets in my annual report, which one do I use? So I said, Shay, that's unusual that a company will report two balance sheets, <laughs> you know, just to confuse people. And what it actually was, was uh, one said, it was a concise balance sheet and it was sort of earlier on in, in the annual report. And then towards the end with the rest of the financial statements, there was the consolidated statement of financial position. So that was the real balance sheet, the consolidated or group accounts statement of financial position, which is a name for a balance sheet. Okay. Don't use concise accounts. Concise means shortcutted, very, very succinct summary accounts. We don't want to use concise. Okay, so don't use anything that says concise in the name. So concise balance sheet, I told her, don't, do not use this one, use your consolidated statement of financial position. We want to use your consolidated or group accounts. Now, um, before we move on, I just want to see if there's any questions, any other questions um, so far from anyone that we can answer. problems with actually getting my um, balance sheet to transfer probably into the restated section if that makes sense. Um, I followed your video and for some reason either it's just the wording that's wrong which is why I can't find it 
or if it's just something else I'm doing. I'm just not sure as to why it's not transferring. Yeah, and you're linking it and it's just not coming up um, linking? Yes, um, I was on um, past session last night and another lady is having a same sort of problem and we were told it would be a little bit faster to just open up a new Excel document and just transfer it over. And if it works, then she's all sweet. I haven't tried that just yet, but I was just wondering if it's something that I'm doing or if it's just something so simple. <laughs> oh, that's the first time I've heard of it. Um, you, should, you shouldn't have to create a new document. That template that we give you, um, that should, you should be able to just press equals and it should link it straight through. So I'll, are you in a local tutorial group? Okay, which tutorial group is that? Sorry, I just can't see who's coming up on the screen, so I have no idea who's talking to me. Hi, oh, it's Natasha. Um, I'm from Rockhampton. Okay, so in, in your tutorial group with Martin, just raise that, just share your screen, and Martin should be able to have to see what's going on and he'll be able to let you know what to do from there. You may need to contact ITD, but it's unusual that you shouldn't be able, like, that nothing would come up when you link it. Um, I'm also happy for anyone to jump into my tutorial group as well uh, after the session. So if, if you've got other questions specifically, um, happy for any, any student to join into my tutorial group. And I'm pretty sure you'll find most of the teaching team also is. For distant students who would like to join tutorials afterwards, uh, we're quite happy to have you join our um, tutorial online sessions through the links. Any other questions? Okay, so from week five, we went through linking, talking about linking. It's pretty important that you link. You must link, don't retype everything in. Um, if you make a mistake in your underlying financials, you will see the importance of linking. If you've linked, you only have to correct your mistake in one place and it will flow through, it's beautiful. However, if you make a mistake and you haven't linked, you're gonna to have to find everywhere you've put that item that you've made a mistake in and you're gonna to have to manually correct it, which is a bit of a nightmare. So we want you to learn to link. It's definitely something you will need to use in the real world. I don't think I've had a job where I haven't had to use it or create Excel spreadsheets, sometimes quite complex Excel spreadsheets where you don't use linking. Okay, linking makes your job and your life so much easier. So take the time now to learn how to link. Um, you do have to link cells between worksheets. And what is the first button you press when linking cells? Does anybody, can anybody jump in and let me know? Equal. Yep, equals button, excellent. <laughs> okay, there's other ways to do formulas, of course, um, but when we link, if you just press equals, click in the cell that you want to link to, and then hit enter, you're done. That's as hard as linking gets. So I'm gonna focus now on some tips and hints on restating the balance sheet. And I'll go through a few um, little bit of groundwork, I suppose, before we do the tips and hints. First of all, remember, I'm not going to go through restating the balance sheet today because I've already done that. It's in the video presentations of Moodle. It's actually changed now to the right-hand side. So I'm gonna to go to the Moodle site and just show you where it is. So I'm gonna point out two things. You've got the study guide, top right-hand corner, and right underneath the study guide, you've got the videos, okay? Now the study guide, again, I've seen some UBU comments about chapter four, <laughs> Martin's wonderful chapter four. Um, if you haven't read it, you should have by now, because you have to write KCQs on it. It also is your Bible for restating all of your financial statements. So click into your study guide and make sure that you've got chapter four downloaded. I've printed out a few pages um, just so I can manually refer to them. The videos, again, if you click into the videos, you'll see all, the, all of the preceding ones. The one that you want for this week's work is restating your firm's balance sheet. It's not actually that long, it's less than half an hour, and it takes you through step-by-step step exactly how I restate Wes Farmer's balance sheet, as well as the checks and balances, which I will also cover today as well. Okay, so. That's the video presentations. Don't joke about the acronym. I had students in a 
three unit, having a joke about what the BS could stand for. Okay, so in our unit, the BS stands for the balance sheet. Uh, Maria, could I just ask a question? Um, sure. You know when you had the Moodle site up and you show where the videos are, some students are finding that they're hidden. You know how you've got to check on the little box up the top, that um, uh, the one with the lines in it on the top row there, that sometimes that side panel is hidden. So you've got to click on that to show it. Yes, thanks, Karen. I forgot to mention that. Again, you, you raised that in week five for me. This little block here is called hide blocks. If you can see on my screen, top right hand corner. And at the moment, if I've hidden the blocks, you can't see anything in the right on the right hand side of Moodle. You've got to unhide it by toggling. It's a little click button. So it toggles on and off when every time you click it. Um, just it's under your profile picture, essentially right next to the cog wheel is that a number of little lines with a tiny arrow. That's your hide blocks button. So what Karen's saying is if you can't see the study guide link or the videos link, unhide your little blocks so you can actually see them, which is a good point. So you can see I'm toggling it off and on now. So I can toggle it on, then I can see everything. Um, and when I toggle it off, it's gone. I just leave mine toggled on. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Maria. All right. So the BS on pages um, 10 to 14 of chapter four of the study guide, Martin describes to you very succinctly and even scans in his workings how to restate Rhyme and Healthcare's balance sheet. Okay, so this is the second statement that you'll need to restate, your statement of financial position. So what I'd like you to do if you've got your um, Excel spreadsheet from assignment one in front of you. Just open up your own balance sheet that you entered into Excel for assignment one and just see if it matches the accounting equation. So make sure that your company either has total assets matching total liabilities and equity or total assets minus total liabilities matching equity. Okay, so either the total assets method or the net assets method. So you can be checking that while I'm um, talking. And if it doesn't, then you've got to go back to your original balance sheets and fix up what you forgot to enter. <laughs> because I've yet to see a company not balance their balance sheet. So if yours doesn't balance, um, it just means you've accidentally missed something out or you've double counted something, or you've made an error in the formulas, your sum formulas, which are there to, to help you check. Then follow my video presentation on Moodle. It's less than half an hour, seriously. And that's with me explaining to you um, how to, to, to do it as well. So you could probably get it done in a shorter time than that. However, being your first time that you're being exposed to this, it may take you longer, okay? Now, the hardest part about restating again is not so much the restating because we're just grouping them into ONF. It's actually looking at every item on your balance sheet, understanding what it is to be able to class it, classify it as O or F. And I've seen some good posts already on the Facebook page with some items saying, oh, I think I've, I've done it as O or I've done it as F. Does anybody else agree or what's everybody else's thoughts? And that's great. That's the idea. We, we want you to be discussing these things. So if you've got an item on your balance sheet that you have no idea what on earth it is, have a bit, do a bit of research, see if you can understand it, look at your company's notes, and then you decide whether it's O and F, and then you can air your thoughts over the social media forums and see what your peers think. And then you can include that discussion in your Word document to your marker so we can see that you've engaged in that discussion and there are marks for that, okay? Now, just, just say you've listened to my video, you've gone through and you've restated your balance sheet and it balances. And you think, well, how can I check that I've got it right? Or you've gone through and you've restated and it doesn't balance. What if things go wrong? What can I do? So over the next couple of slides, I'll just go through some of the tips and checks and balances that you can run through. So normally when um, we're restating our balance sheet, we have a new accounting equation, okay? Because we're splitting things into O and F, so we've got operating and 
financial, you, you, you basically want to um, think about the, the accounting equation in terms of operating and financial. So our new accounting equation that we're trying to balance is net operating assets equals our net financial obligations plus equity. Okay, so we're still balancing our debits with our credits. We're just rearranging the group, the items into the O and F groups. Okay, so the important thing about balancing your balance sheet is making sure your debits still match your credits. Make sure that you have split up your cash into operating and financial. So um, there was a, a few posts about the percentage that you can use. Martin recommends in chapter four to use between 0.5 to 1% um, of your revenue. So look at your cash balance and compare it to your total revenue and then allocate up to 1% of your revenue. So, you, so you're looking at the proport, you're allocating cash, not revenue, but you're looking at the allocation proportion in relation to revenue. Okay, so students sometimes um, misunderstand that section of, of the video. So you're still splitting cash, you're not splitting revenue, splitting cash, but you're splitting it on the proportion of 1% of revenue. Okay, and I'll show you how to do that in, in the video. But make sure that you are splitting it up into O and F. Now, the percentage wise, you can choose. Martin does recommend that 0.5 to 1%, but if you feel a different percentage is warranted for your split, that's perfectly fine. You just need to write about it and give us your justification in the Word document. Um, it obviously must be linked. We want you to learn to link. It will save you time. It also makes your spreadsheet so much more efficient. So it must be linked. If you find you are writing in lines, that's usually a pretty good indicator that um, you're, you're adding in something that shouldn't be there. Okay, we don't want you to be typing in things. We want you to be linking. All you were doing is rearranging what you've already entered in the previous sheet. Now some checks that you can do to make sure that it balances. I'll just skip to the bottom one and it says equity should match your restated comprehensive income equity. So restated statement of changes in equities equity. So you would have already done that as part of week five. So your statement of changes in equity, you will have a closing balance for your restated statement of changes in equity. That equity balance should match to the equity balance in your balance sheet. Okay, that's what that bottom line is. That's your first check. Because remember, your statement of changes in equity is presenting all of the changes in equity in your balance sheet. So those two balances must match for equity. So equity in your SOCIE, your statement of changes in equity, should match equity in your balance sheet. Okay, and I, I mentioned that one in week five as well. That's one of the important checks. I perform that check when I'm marking. It's one of the first things I check. So if your equity balances don't balance, then I'm pretty sure you, you know, you've made an error somewhere. You've either forgotten something or double counted something or your formulas are incorrect. Now, if your balance sheet doesn't balance, the first thing I do when, so if we're doing this in the Mackay um, tutorial workshops, the first thing I will get my students to do usually, because there's so many of us, is I will say, go back through and do these two checks for me. Check that add up all your, in your restated balance sheet, add up all your operating assets, the total for that, and add that to all of your financial assets, the total for that. Okay, those two totals must match your total assets in your original financials. Because remember, all we're doing is splitting our assets up into O and F here. So if these two don't match, then you've done something wrong. Okay, you've either double counted or you've accidentally linked to the wrong cell or you've um, missed out an item of an asset. And it's usually quite simple when you do this check because the balance that you're out by is usually what you missed or what you've double counted. Okay, so that's your first check. So go through and in your restated balance sheet, add up your operating assets and your financial assets. That's literally all of your total assets from your original financials. Because all you've done, the idea of restating the balance sheet is to split your total assets into O and F and to split your total liabilities into O and F as well. 
Okay, so do the same check for your liabilities as well. Make sure add up the operating liabilities plus financial liabilities, and then check that those two figures match the total liabilities in your original financials from assignment one. Okay, so again, if you if they don't match, it, you will have accidentally transferred or linked something across incorrectly. So you can go back, and that just helps you to isolate instead of having to go through every single line item again. Um, it just helps you to isolate your error either in your assets or your liabilities. Now, the reason I haven't got equity there is your equity is a straight copy and paste, or not copy and paste, a straight link from your original financials. All you're doing is simply linking your equity across. You do not restate your equity. Okay, when we restate the balance sheet, we are only restating assets and liabilities, and we're just grouping them into O and F. So if you've made an error, it has to be somewhere here. Unless, of course, you've accidentally missed linking equity across properly. So that's pretty much all that can go wrong, um, all that, that I've seen go wrong. Now, you can see why it's so important to get assignment one right. Because if your balance sheet doesn't balance originally, it's not going to balance when you restate it. So I've had a couple students last term and um, one student was actually, she was a HD student, she was um, quite um, on top of everything. And for some reason, she, so she did these tests and it didn't match, but she'd linked everything across. So I said, well, hang on, go across to your original financials. Does your original balance sheet balance? And when we checked it out, no, it didn't. So she'd accidentally missed something in her original balance sheet. So it's so important to use our feedback from assignment one to correct your sheets before you start restating, okay? So if, you're, if these don't match and you've done everything right, you might like to just check that your original balance sheet balances because if it doesn't, that error is going to carry forward. Okay, so that's your tips and checks. And I can guarantee if you do these tips and checks, you will find your error. There's no other error that you can make. Okay, so these are your tips and checks. And if these still don't work for you, you will need to then go through line by line and check and color code. And say, okay, I've checked this, I've transferred that across rightly, color code, next line. So this little check here is just to help streamline that process for you. So you will find your error if you do that. Now, I've got an interactive question and this sort of, I've already discussed this in the lecture so far, so I sort of want to see what your thoughts are and what you've taken from what I've said, or if we have to discuss it a little bit more. So what do I do if I have net financial assets instead of net financial obligations? So back here when I said our new um, accounting equation was net operating assets equals net financial obligations plus equity. What if instead of net financial obligations, you've got net financial assets? What if you've got a debit here instead of a credit? And then some students also have net operating liabilities instead of net operating assets. So what do you do if you if you have debits and credits? So click onto the next slide and I'll give you a couple minutes to just fill in what you think you would do if you've got net financial assets rather than net financial obligations when you are restating your balance sheet. Uh, net financial assets minus equity. Yep, that's great. <laughs> so, so that's one way of doing it. Um, so we'll, we'll get some more responses in and I'll go through them. So this is good. This is showing some new accounting equations for the restated balance sheet. So this is pretty important. This is the sort of stuff that your peers will be posting. So, you know, I don't know how many we've got on, on Zoom now, but say, you know, around 50 students or so, there's still a few hundred students who aren't right here right now listening to this lecture. So you're going to get these, you're going to see these sorts of questions pop up 
on the unit's Facebook page, maybe on the discussion forums in Moodle, maybe in your class tutorials. And because you've attended our lecture today, you'll be able to help them, okay? These are very commonly asked questions like, my company doesn't have the new accounting equation, the net operating assets equals NFO plus equity. How do I balance it? And what do I do if I have net financial assets rather than net financial ob obligations? Or what do I do if I have net operating liabilities rather than net operating assets? So here's some new ways to balance your debits and credits. Okay, and, and, that, and that's right. As long as you are balancing your debits with your credits, then your restated balance sheet will be correct. That's the most important thing. So in, in this one, we've got um, net financial assets equals, this probably should be net operating liabilities plus equity. That's fine because we've got debits and it will be equaling credits on the left. And same with the next one, we've got net financing obligations equals NFA minus equity. So we've got credits on the left in this case, debits on the right. That's still fine as long as it balances. <laughs> the, the idea is we need to balance debits and credits. Here we've got equity minus NFA, so that would probably be a credit situation. So you would need a debit on the other side, or you'll have a, a negative here. So you could re reverse this to make it the equation above. The, the important concept is debits must match credits. Okay, so very good. So what you, you've got the idea. You need to rearrange your accounting equation to make sure that your debits balance with your credits. Okay, very good. So please help your peers out. When you see these sorts of questions, go, I know, they just need to rearrange their equation and you can help them out. So you can say, well, what do you have? Do you have net financing assets? Then you'll need to and give them the new equation, help them out. Very good, thank you for the three that contributed to that. So here's a couple of rearranged um, accounting equations. Very good. Oh, and that's it. That's, um, that's a little bit early. <laughs> um, teaching team, did you, before I get to the minute paper, did you want to raise anything from restating the, the balance sheet this week? Maria, it's John. Hey, John. Okay, um, just uh, on the, calculation of the 1% of revenue for operating cash, some students um, calculate 10% rather than 1%. Um, just need to be careful that you get that percentage right. Yes, good point. Thank you for that. Um, while I'm on the topic actually, I might just quickly go to the study guide and just show people again, um, where we get this 0.5 to 1%. It is just 0.5 to 1%, not 10%. It's one decimal place over and it makes a huge difference. I'll just go down uh, too far. Okay. Let me zoom this in now that I've found it. So on page 11 of chapter four, it's part of Martin going through restating Ryman Healthcare's um, balance sheet. It, Martin says, one of the more difficult items in a balance sheet to restate is cash, okay? And generally um, a firm could hold cash balances that is not needed in the actual operations of a firm. In such cases, it would be a financial asset. That's the reason we like you to split cash into O and F because of that line right there. Okay, a firm can sometimes hold more cash than it needs for day-to-day -day operations. So what we what we've said to do is up to one percent of sales might be an appropriate level of cash for many businesses to hold to conduct their operations. Now. So this is where we get the 1% from. What John is saying is it's 1%, not 10%. So if you're putting this in as a decimal place, it's 0.01, okay, not 0.1. If you're putting in 0.1, you're going to get 10%. So just make sure that you are converting this to the right decimal place when you are doing your calculations. Again, you don't need to go with 1%. You might like to use 10%, but you need to give us a reason of why you're using 10%, or you might like to use a different reason. Uh, you might have 5%, um, 7%, 8%, it doesn't matter. If you want to use a different percentage, that's fine. 
but we just want you to give us a reason why. We like to see your reasoning and your logic. And it could just be that a, a different percentage suits your industry better, your particular company's industry, and that's fine. But we want to see that you're thinking and justifying your decisions because that's what you'll be expected to do in the real world in your jobs. The other one, um, Maria, the other one, Maria, yeah. that sometimes confuses students when they go down to their work paper to calculate their 1% of revenue, they put their revenue figure in the cell for the four, year, four years, they calculate the 1% and instead of taking the 1% of revenue as operating um, cash and taking that away from their total cash figure to get their financial cash, they subtract it from the revenue figure. Um, it, it's and they just don't know, didn't notice that they've actually um, subtracted it from the wrong figure and they've taken it from the revenue figure rather than from the total cash figure. That's happened a number of times as well. So you need to be very careful what you're doing. Yeah, that's a good point. I briefly mentioned that before. We are splitting cash, not revenue. The only reason we even refer to revenue is because how much cash do we put to O? How much do we put to F? So in helping us to determine how much cash we put to O, we refer to 1% of revenue or whatever. Um, what John is saying is don't split your revenue. Don't forget and ac accidentally link your revenue figure in. <laughs> we don't want you to split revenue. We want you to split the cash figure. So once you've done your split in your calculations and how I show you how to do it in the, in the video, go back through and add up your operating cash and your financial cash and make sure those two figures match your total cash balance. And if they don't, you probably accidentally split revenue up instead of cash. Okay, so that's a really good point. Make sure you are splitting cash, not revenue. Make sure you link your split to your cash balances, not your revenue balance. The only time we're linking to our revenue is to check that it's 1%, that the, the cash that we're allocating to O is 1% or whatever percentage you've chosen. What else have I forgotten, teaching team? <laughs> Hi, Maria. This is Lois in Brisbane. One more thing is just making sure before they even start that restating or as they're restating, they've made sure as they've got feedback from assignment one, step four, they've corrected everything that they need to do so that they can actually restate the correct figures. Yes, I can't harp on enough about that. <laughs> Please make sure that you have your assignment one right before you move to assignment two. Like I said, it happens to the best of us. We just keep going, oh yes, I've finished that now, I'm going to keep going with assignment two and then it doesn't balance and we're all out and then we go back to see why. We do all the checks and balances and we're still out and then we go back and we realise, well, it's because our original financials were wrong. So take the time to use your feedback from assignment one to get your assignment one right so that you're starting with that on a good basis for your assignment two. Okay, so please make sure that you're um, using that feedback and, and you can check with your local tutors or your markers who've given you that feedback if you're not sure how to get it right. And John again, Maria, the students who are most risk uh, in that particular exercise are those who did not use their uh, Excel sum, sum function to um, calculate their subtotals and their totals when they did the copy and paste exercise of the accounts. Um, because the marker, uh, quite often, because they have no way of checking, um, because the um, Excel function, uh, sum function wasn't used for the subtotals, totals, sometimes misses that in fact there is an item wrong within the financial statements. So don't, don't automatically assume that because it's been marked that that may have been picked up if you haven't used your uh, Excel sum function to calculate your subtotals and totals in your financial statements. Yes, that's a good point too, actually. Um, Martin's had to fix up a few of my markings, actually. <laughs> he always tells me about them too. <laughs> um, you know, like we mark, your markers mark so many of these spreadsheets and Word documents. Sometimes our, our minds do get a bit boggled and sometimes we just miss something that's, that's obvious. Um, so if you haven't used a formula to sum your totals, which I tell you to do in the, in the videos, you, and you just type in that total, it will look correct to your marker. 
So I, if I'm looking through it, I'm like, oh yeah, well the total balance, you know, the balance sheet balances, that's, that looks good to me. Um, and I can see that you've just, you haven't used the sum formula, you've just typed the, the number in. The, all the feedback you'll get from me is, you should have used a formula for your totals here. I won't go through and click in the cell and type equals sum and do the formula for you and then double check that because that would, I wouldn't physically be able to mark your assignments on a timely basis if I was to do that. So what John's saying is if you haven't used the sum formula to check your totals, your marker may have missed that you've missed a line or double counted a line or put an error in your original financials. So when you come to restating your balance sheet or statement of changes in equity or income statement, when you come to doing that and you get an error and you've done all my checks and balances and you still get an error, go back and check your totals from your original um, financials in assignment one. And if you haven't used the sum formula, go back and use the sum formula because that's a check. That's why I tell you to do them when you're first entering them in so that you don't come unstuck in a subsequent assignment. And usually John's saying, usually the students who have errors in restating are those that didn't use some formulas for their totals um, and other formula checks in their original financials. So again, if, if your peers, it's probably not people listening to this video, uh, but if your peers are asking those sorts of questions, oh, you know, I've got an error and I can't figure it out, you know how to help them. You can say, look, go back, check your sum formulas from your original financials. Do they match? Did you just type in the total? You know, there's a reason that we ask you to do the sum formulas because that's an additional check that you've got it right. Very good, thanks. John and Lois and Karen. <laughs> the teaching team makes things so much richer, makes your experience so much richer. I'd be lost without them. All right, let's go to the minute paper so I can take some time to answer all of your questions. So I'll give you a couple minutes. Well, no, I won't. I'll give you a minute because it says minute paper. <laughs> so I'll give you a minute to answer these two questions. Of course, as I'm answering the questions, you can keep, keep them rolling in. So what was the most important thing you learned today and what questions still remain unanswered? And I'll do my best to get through them. If not answer them today, at least point you to your tutorials um, to answer them in. Okay, so you've got a minute. So it's 9.48, so 9.49, I'm going to start looking at your um, and commenting on your responses. All right, that was two minutes actually. <laughs> Let's go through it. So I've got four, five. All right, got a few coming through. So what was the most important thing that you learned today? So checks for restating the balance sheet, including, so net operating assets, so debits equaling NFO plus equity, that's our credits, that's right. Um, the OA plus FA, so the operating um, assets and financial assets equaling your original total assets. And again, your operating liabilities and financial liabilities equal at, equaling your original total liabilities. And of course, your restated equity must 
match your original equity because it's the same thing. You're not doing any restating of that, you're simply just transferring it over. So that's a great thing to remember about today and that will definitely help you when you're restating, helping to restate and balance your balance sheet. Um, okay, but you need to split your cash into operating and financial by 1% or any percentage that you choose. Um, we just recommend up to 1%. So some students use half a percent, 1%, it's up to you. You can choose a different percentage, just justify it. And just make sure, like John pointed out, that you are putting 0 0.01 as your decimal when you're doing that um, and not 0.1, because that will make you split 10% to operating instead of 1%. That I need to watch the videos. Yes, you do need to watch the videos. <laughs> Look, you can, it is possible to restate Believe it or not, it's possible to restate without my videos. It was done years before my videos were actually created. So when we when we first started teaching this unit, um, there were no videos. I didn't do videos until the last few years. So the videos only came into being because we saw students struggling with restating. And so I thought, oh, but, you know, we, we better see if we can provide a bit more support. So it is possible to do it without the videos. It's just it may be a bit more of a frustrating experience if you do it without the video. So if you need to watch them, yes, please do. That's why they're there. In your financial statements, if your financial statements are inaccurate in the first step, in restating them, the inaccuracy is going to be made more apparent. Yes, well, it's not going to balance. <laughs> so please make sure that you're correcting assignment one before you move, before you start assignment two. But the good thing is, do you know, well, although we've said this, if you've linked, so say you've already gone gung-ho and you forgot to correct assignment one and you've started assignment two, if you've linked everything, you will just be able to go and correct the mistakes in assignment one and it will flow through to assignment two. Unless, of course, you had to add in a line, then you'll have to make sure you link to that line. Um, but that's the, that's the beauty of it. So you've accidentally done typos or you've um, included wrong formulas, all you have to do is just fix that in assignment one and it will automatically flow through through all your links to assignment two. So it may not be such a huge um, problem if you've already started assignment two without fixing assignment one. But anyway, so make sure it's, it's preferable to have fixed previous steps before you move on. What percentage to use for splitting the cash in the balance sheet and also the accounting equations that you use for checking whether there is any mistakes in the balance sheet after restating it. That's great, two important things that is, um, that you've learned today. So what percentage to use for splitting the cash? And you would have um, learned about that anyway, reading chapter four. But also this is extremely important. I'm really glad to see so many pe people picking up on that's their important thing that they've learned, the new accounting equation. So how you can rearrange that accounting equation when you are restating, making sure that your debits still match your credit. So great take out. The total assets and liabilities of the financial statement should match the combined values of O and F, assets and liabilities in the restated. Yes, that's right. Because remember, the whole thing that we're doing with restating in our unit is just moving them around, moving all of our assets and liabilities into O and F. That's all we're doing. So that's very right. Those totals should match the combined values of the O and F groups in our restated balance sheets. The importance of the sum equations in the spreadsheet and how it will confirm the accuracy of the data. Yeah, it, it helps you confirm the accuracy of your inputting of the data, but it also helps to confirm the accuracy of your company's data. And a lot of students do find that their companies sometimes are a little bit out by one or two million dollars um, because of rounding in their financials because they round them to such large amounts sometimes they are out by one or two uh, figures at the end in their financials so it does help to confirm the accuracy of data mainly of your data input but also that of your companies make sure i find what percentage works best for my company not just assume and make sure the percentage chosen is explained that's right we're happy for you to use any percentage um, if you feel like 1% isn't appropriate for your firm. Make sure your balance sheet for assignment one is right, <laughs> definitely. Reworking the equation, 
the balance sheet does not have something, i.e. not having net financial assets. Yeah, so balancing your debits and your credits when you're restating, so this is very good. To check our assignment feedback before beginning restating, if you haven't already done so, making sure that that's correct. Using revenue to calculate how much cash for the O and F split rather than the cash amount. Yeah, so we split the cash. We split the cash. We just use, we refer to revenue in determining how much to split to O. Okay, but you are still splitting the cash into O and F. Revenue is only determined in how much of that cash to split to O. Can you explain again how to differentiate operational and so operating and financial activities? Sure. So in our unit, in so for this unit, ACCT 11059, we differentiate O and F using um, the firm and its inputs. So if we if I cast your mind back to the diagram, I guess that Martin shows you in chapter four, you have your inputs operating inputs being your customers and, and your suppliers. So anything to do with day-to-day -day operations that deals with those markets, your customer market or your supplier market, generally will be operation, operating. Financial activities, we, or we refer to anything which funds your entity. So debt or equity investors, anything to do with those markets will generally be um, financial. Now, some people's companies may have items, so something that's, for example, a cash flow hedge, that's used for different purposes by their companies. So one company might use a cash flow hedge for operating purposes. Another company might use cash flow hedges for financial purposes. So it's important to get to know your company, what what these items are, what your company is doing with them or what they're using them or why they've been created, and then justify why you're classifying something as O and F. Now, in, in a lot of cases, it may be fairly straightforward. For example, trade debtors or accounts receivable, they're directly to do with your customers. So you can pretty much safely classify those as O. But a lot of the times in your financials, you might have an item that's really vague. For example, provisions, derivatives, and you're sort of like, well, what is it a provision of? What is the derivative of? So you actually have to go to the notes in your financial statements to actually read what the provisions are or the derivatives or whatever item it is, figure out what they're using them for, and then think, well, is that more to do with operating, you know, customers, suppliers, employees, day-to-day -day interactions, or is it more to do with investing and funding the assets of a company through bank loans or um, shares or other funding means. So if the, the important thing is you need to know your company and you need to understand the difference between O and F. So chapter four of the study guide, it's way back up here. And Martin included a really nice diagram from a previous student, one of our previous students, Rebecca. Um, she did this, she sort of expanded the diagram that Martin started with. So this is the diagram that Martin um, has, has put in here. And I like this, it's nice and simple. So it says operating is to do with these markets, customers and suppliers. Financial is to do with, you know, banks, your debt investors, shareholders, equity investors. And Rebecca then took this in her KCQs <laughs> and explained them and, and sort of gave a few more examples. So she's expanded that diagram. Um, and, you know, for example, with your equity investors, things like share issues, share buybacks, dividends, you know, that's to do with um, financial. So you would classify those sorts of things as F. Same with these sorts of items, interest payments, um, repayments of um, bank loans and other issue of debt. So these sort of items are all F. These sort of items, any operating revenues, any operating expenses, they're usually O's. On your balance sheet, you'll come across items like provisions. And some of those provisions will be to do with things like your employee entitlements. So you have to think a little bit further. You think, okay, hang on. So I've got a provision for annual leave or a provision for a long service leave. That's a liability on my balance sheet. Is that O or F? 
And you have to think, okay, well, what is that provision to do with? It's to do with the entitlements of my employees. Do my employees work in the operating side of my business or do they fund the business? So you say, well, no, employees are to do with the operating side, employ them to, you know, work in the business on a day-to-day -to, -day to, to serve my customers. Um, so, and, and so, you know, sometimes to collect, pay my suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. So my employees are to do with the operating side of my business. So I'm going to classify provision as O. So sometimes you have to talk yourself through why something is O or why it's F. In my video, I sort of give you little hints and tips as to, oh, well, this one's O and this one's O and this one's F because, and for example, um, borrowings on your balance sheet are pretty much always going to be F because they're to do with debt investors. So if you've got borrowings on your balance sheet, whether it's non-current or current, they're all just F. Um, tax, I, I mentioned in my videos, is to do with your operations. <laughs> so it's O. I have seen students, however, classify some tax items as F on the basis that they were to do with investments for financing the, their, their particular firm in the future. So I'd want you to do it, say I'm classifying my deferred tax liability as F because their particular company had, had a, um, some investment or something which was to do with providing for assets in the future for their firm. So they justified that as F. So even though in the video I say, look, this is usually O, you know, tax is usually O because it's to do with the operation. So classify that as O. The easy way out would be just to listen to Maria and classify it as O. But you may actually think, hang on, no, I've, I've investigated this and it's not O. I think it should be it. And that's fine. That's what we like you to do. I want you to start thinking for yourselves, making those judgment calls because in the real world, nobody cares whether it's O and F. What people do care about is what you think it is and how you justify that. They want your, your advice and your opinion justified. Okay, so I hope that answered how to differentiate O and F. <laughs> that was a little bit long. Um, if I add in lines to my statements, do I add them in the original statements first? Yes, if you have to add in lines because you've accidentally missed something, we need to correct something, please make sure that you do it in the originals because in your restated financials, we just want you linking. And in your next sheet where you are doing your ratios, we just want you linking to the first two sheets. So from now on, you will just be linking. You will not be typing. Um, there are a couple lines we do get you to add in in your restated income statement. But again, they're linked back. So we get you to add them in, but they're still linked. So if you have found that you've accidentally forgotten some lines from a previous um, statement, please make sure you go back and you add those in. I've completed the restated, <laughs> yeah, that's great. And some students have already completed the restated financial statements. So I knew the basis of most, most things said already, which is great. That means you can help out others as well. You can be very, um, one, one of the teaching team in our unit. All right, what questions still remain unanswered? Let's have a look. How am I out? How am I out my over $2 million in my restated equity where I haven't restated anything. So you would, I would say there's an area in your underlying equity. So go back to your original statements, your physical annual reports, if you've printed them or your electronic annual reports, have a look, go back line for line in your equity. Okay. You will have to make sure you've got it all balanced because you, you aren't restating equity. You never restate equity ever. In your statement of changes in equity, you simply carry the transactions with shareholders across. You just link back to them. We don't restate them. The only thing you're restating in your statement of changes in equity is your other CI. We covered that in week five. So you never restate equity. In your balance sheet, you're still not restating equity. The only things we restate in the balance sheet is assets and liabilities. So again, you're just linking back. You're just transferring your equity. So if you're already out, something is out in your original financials. So go back to your first sheet, go back to your physical annual report, financial statements, and check. Okay. Now, if you've, so you've said, I've just double checked my annual report, the equity attributable to equity holders of the company has not been counted in my firm's balance sheet. Why is the case? Okay. So in week, must have been week one, maybe week one or week two, um, in the first couple of weeks anyway, we covered an idea of that your company can own other companies. So your company is like the parent company and it has all the little children companies and we call them subsidiaries. 
in accounting terms. And when it prepares financial statements, it has to add up all 100% of all of its children companies or its subsidiaries into the, into the parent company's financial reports. And we call those accounts then consolidated reports because it contains all of the group's financials. Okay, so that is what we wanted you to use for your assignment. So sometimes your companies will show you the amounts of income or profit or equity that is attributed to all of these baby companies, not the um, equity holders of the parent company. They will show you the split. They'll say, you know, 80% is split to here and then, you know, 20% split to here. You still need to include that in your accounts, okay? So in your firm's balance sheet, it will still have to balance so they will balance, if it doesn't balance, you're looking at the wrong balance sheet. Okay, so your balance sheet will include 100% of the equity of all of the groups. It may split it up. It will say, this is my this is the um, equity attributable to the parent. This is the minority interest equity, but it still has to include them. Otherwise it won't balance. It can't mathematically balance. If it's included all of the assets and liabilities of all the babies, in here, it has to also include the equity in here or your balance sheet won't balance. Okay, so go back and make sure that your balance sheet balances. That's what you need to do. Okay, so if the 2 million is to do with the minority interests, i.e. the subsidiaries, the, the, the parts that aren't just related to the company, make sure that you are still including that line in your equity component. All right, your balance sheet has to balance. And again, um, so the student that asked this question, if you don't have a tutorial group to go to after this, join my tutorial group and you can share your screen. So in my group, what we do is I go through what I want to run through first, <laughs> I'll consolidate my topics and then I work, so I'll open up the floor and all my students will then say, I've got this problem. They'll share their screen with me and we actually go through it as a group because some other students might also have that same problem. Um, so, and if you don't feel comfortable doing it and sharing it in front of everybody, I have a couple of students like that too. They just wait till the end when I say, okay, bye everybody else and everybody else goes and they just stay on at the end and they just work with me. So um, you're well, so if you don't have a tutorial group to go so, so that somebody can help you out with this, um, join mine, quite happy for you to join mine. But that's essentially what you need to do. Go back to your original balance sheet and make sure it balances in your company's accounts and that you've then transferred that across because you might have just accidentally missed that line. No questions? Can't say what questions I have that remain unanswered as they don't really occur to me until they appear in my work. Oh, that's me. That's so me. Um, none. How to determine how much cash to allocate to operating, not just assuming 1%. Um, so some students in the past have said, my company operates on a cashless basis. So we actually don't need any cash for operating or we, we need extremely minimal cash. I think 1% is too much. So they've changed that or they've said, I'm actually going to, they just call on a, um, like a bank overdraft account. So I've seen students justify it with very little, zero to very little. I haven't really seen anybody I've seen a couple of students do 10%, but I think that was an accident from 1%. And I've seen one or two students in the past choose 5% because they said their industry was fairly reliant on cash. Um, customers expected cash. It was sometimes um, if they worked in remote locations, um, electronic systems didn't work. So they required cash to do their transactions. So I've had a few students who have actually chosen different percentage other than the one percent. Um, teaching team, have you seen any different percentages and how and what sort of how did the students justify their use? I guess is what how I'm interpreting that question. I haven't, Maria. They've tended to just do the one percent from what I can remember from last year, which is not a lot. Yeah, thanks, Kara. I mean, me too. Like I said, there's only been one or two students that have really done that. But just, I don't know, anyone else? Have, have you had anything different? My students do tend to just stick to that 1%. Yeah, okay. Uh, Maria, John, most students use a 1%. Yeah, okay. So again, for the student who 
um, asked this question, how to determine how much cash to allocate to operating. Um, you, you might feel that for your company, how, how would you know if it's different? You would really need to know your company and the industry it operates in, um, whether it relies on a lot of cash in its day-to-day -day operations. Um, so what sort of business is it? For example, if it's, a, if it's an airline, you might, it 1% might be fine. I mean, a lot of people pay for their, their airline things online. It's purely online um, using, using their, you know, direct debits. It may be fine. Um, I don't know, I can't think of <laughs> too many different examples. There may be, like I said, with the student's example that they used 5%, they were very reliant on um, remote systems, so remote areas in operation, and they did rely on cash. Their justification was they relied on cash more, so they felt a 5% was justified. That's fine. We're really just looking to see your understanding. Do you, do you think this is reasonable? And if so, why? If not, why not? So most students do just use the 1%, it's just easier to. <laughs> and again, in a subsequent um, assignment step, I do a similar thing using the weighted average cost of capital. Martin recommends to use 10% for that. And I always say, have a look for your company's own and just if you can find it, use that. Again, that's just to prompt you to try to start making your own judgments and justifications. <laughs> So don't, don't read too much into it, you know, don't get stuck on this. If you're not sure how to determine how much cash, just use the 1%. One question I, I still have, can I make my statement pretty using different colours behind the writing instead of blue? Yes, you can. <laughs> also, when linking information needed for my statement of changes in equity, I have info that is on my income statement. Do I need to link to my restated statement to original income statement? Yes. No, don't type it in manually. Um, linked to your income statement. So that's splitting up other COI. So your company would have one line for other COI in your restated statement of changes in equity. Instead of just linking to that one line, make sure that your total in your income statements, so the split in your income statement still matches to that total, and then split these items and linked to the income statement items, okay, Mary, in your restated statement of changes in equity. Yep. Yeah, sorry, Mary, it's John. Just in, um, um, improving the, finessing the presentation of your Excel spreadsheet, which is, which is fine. Just be careful that a uh, student, you need to be careful they don't end up with merged cells, which, which does cause problems for anyone trying to work on that uh, spreadsheet later. Yeah, there is um, some of the, some of the um, lines actually already in the template spreadsheet are merged cells. Merged cells, people either love them or hate them. So if you know how to use and work with merged cells, you can use them. If you don't, it can create problems for you later um, because you can't format or link to or change some merged cells once you've merged them. Um, so some of the, the working sections below are merged. So Martin, when he's been typing information to you, he'll merge that section and the formatting will carry down. So when you're starting to insert and, and change things, just keep that in mind. If you're inserting lines, they may you may be creating merged cells, which could again create problems later. But I haven't seen too much of that, but just something to be aware of, just something to keep in mind. Um, Okay, how do we know what percentage to use? What is the determinant? The determinant is how well you know your firm and its industry, um, because that will give you a good idea of how well you think they use cash or how, how much they use cash in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Why do you recommend up to the 1%? Okay, so Martin does cover that in here, page 11, I think it was. So you can read that justification. It'll say, um, Typically, it's not clear from a firm's financial statements how much of any cash balances are needed in the operations of a firm, so and are operating assets or operating liabilities for a bank overdraft, and how much of any cash balances are simply financial assets. Okay, Where a firm has a relatively low level of cash balances, my advice, that's Martin's advice, is to include these cash balances as an operating asset and assume that they are needed to conduct a firm's operations. What amounts to a 
relatively low level of cash would depend on the nature of a firm's activities. So this is what I'm saying, it's up to you to know your firm, like the student who used the 5% justified it based on their firm's operations in remote areas, saying so they probably need a higher reliance on cash and they might need to have more cash in operations. Um, but typically up to about 1% of sales might be an appropriate level of cash for many businesses to hold to help conduct their operations. So I would say that's based on, a, on an average of all businesses, all industries. Okay, this is why Martin has recommended up to 1%. It's up to you if you feel that your firm, so what's the determinant is how well you know your firm and how well you know the industry, I guess, um, or your own understanding of business, how much your own business might use uh, if you operate your own business, how much you, you actually need of cash in the bank to operate on a day-to-day -day basis. You can also think about how much cash you need to operate on a day-to-day -day basis personally and start thinking about that. Martin mentions that here too, um, about your own personal thinking about how much, pa oh yeah, here. Um, it's similar at a personal level. We can keep some cash that we do not need now in a savings account to earn higher interest, hopefully and save for some future use, which is a financial asset. But we can also keep some cash in a transaction account to use on a day-to-day -day basis to buy things with our debit card, an operating asset that we need for the daily operations of our living. So again, you will know, so well, you can go back and calculate quite easily how much cash you need, how much cash you're holding in your day-to-day -day general transactions account versus your savings account. And you can see the percentage there. Um, maybe take it as a percentage of your income, see how, how much you're holding. And that's essentially what we're doing by suggesting we, we compare it to 1% of sales. So I hope, hopefully that's giving you a bit more insight into the terminants. It's how well you know your day-to-day -day operators, your firms, your industries, how much do they actually need. Uh, no questions, thank you. Um, we've just got an update on the, on the first one, follow-up uh, on, on the the first question about the 2 million in equity that's out. So the students check their original annual report and it doesn't balance in the original annual report. I told you so. <laughs> so if it doesn't there, you need to make sure that you include it so that it will actually balance. Okay, so include the line in your equity component and call it, you know, equity attributed to minority interests and include that as a line in your equity. Okay, it must balance. Your balance sheet has to balance. And I'd really like to see the balance sheet that doesn't balance. So can you please send me a link to your company's annual report? So this is what I'm saying. It does not report in your firm's annual report. I would like to see your balance sheet. <laughs> if, you're, um, if you're happy to join my, my tutorial next, I'd, I'd like to see it there as well, because I've yet to see a balance sheet that doesn't balance. Um, you need to add it in. Your balance sheet needs to balance, okay? Companies must prepare a balance sheet that balances. So I would like to see where it isn't reported in your firm's annual report. <laughs> your balance sheet has to balance. It has to, otherwise your company is not adhering to accounting standards. Teaching team, do you have anything to add to that first comment? <laughs> to the first question? Is there something I'm missing? Am I not reading into it right? I think you've, you've nailed it quite well, uh, Maria. Yeah, it, you, your balance sheet has to balance. There's, there's no ifs and buts. You, you might be looking at the wrong section in your firm's annual report. You might be looking at an incorrect report like the concise balance sheet that my Mackay student was looking at. Your statement of financial position will balance. It has to balance. So you need to make sure that you are entering the correct report into your assignment one. And again, we're happy to help you out with that in tutorials. Make sure you're looking at the correct report to get it into um, to your assignment one before you can start restating for assignment two. But see how important it is to make sure you're getting assignment one right <laughs> because we get these sorts of questions and we're like, go back and have a look at your originals. Are you looking at the right report to start with? This is all about helping you make sense of financial statements, which is the whole purpose of restating by asking these sorts of questions and coming across these sorts of problems. This is fantastic because you will remember it when you come across it in the real world. You will know what this means in the real world because you've hit this problem now at university. And that's the whole purpose 
of setting this assignment for you guys. So I hope that's been helpful. I think we're about to cut off in the next couple of minutes. Um, like I've said, I'm happy for any student to join into my tutorial group. We kick off at 10.30 every Wednesday. And um, again, you're invited to share your screen with, with my group there. And I'm sure all of the teacher team feel the same way. Next week, we will move on with the last instalment of analysing financial statements, which is restating tips and balances and checks on restating the income statements in your comprehensive income statement. And we will revisit the topic of comprehensive income <laughs> next week as well. That was what we, we had a look at in week five. We'll recover that in week seven. Any other comments or questions before we sign off? <laughs> <laughs>